why did the French Constitution of 1946 not include a Declaration of Rights? Well, I want to examine that question here today. And I raise that question because a new Declaration of Rights was thought to be essential for the post-war constitution, as it would define the principles of the new republic. And the deputies of the Constituent Assembly elected on the 21st of October 1945 intended this Declaration of Rights to complete the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789. The principles of 1789 would affirm the key doctrines of freedom, equality and humanity after the debasement of humanity under Nazism. But they would also be completed and expanded upon with the inclusion of social and economic rights for the realities of the age. So why then did the Constitution of October 1946 not include the Declaration of Rights? To be sure, that Constitution included a statement of fundamental rights in its preamble. The 16 rights it proclaimed, it's one less than the 1789 Declaration, asserted, among other things, the equality of women, the equality of races and religion, the rights to education and social welfare, the right to work and the right to strike, and so on. So the question I want to address here is why the Assembly did not commit itself to the detailed Declaration of Rights that was written along with the draft Constitution of April 1946. The preamble was in part an admission of the difficulties of defining social and economic rights. Civil and political rights had become established over the course of France's Republican experience, but social and economic rights were yet to be defined in a formal document. The 1946 document also, declaration also had models to follow. The declarations of and declarations of rights were the norm when new constitutions were distinct, uh, when new constitutions distinguished changes of regime. Although we have to note the important exception of the Constitution of 1875, was this a matter of the final document falling short of the expectations with which it was commenced? I think not. These were new rights. There had been attempts to define social and economic rights prior to 1946, but they had not yet been given form in a constitutional framework. <clears throat> they were hard to pin down because the field of social and economic rights was found to be so vast. A new text of uh, a Declaration of Rights was proposed at the 1936 Dijon Congress of the Ligue des Droits de l'Homme. There followed through the war years a new discourse of rights that promised to restore human dignity and imagined a post-war order of greater liberty and greater equality. There was a Declaration of Rights of the Free French in London of 1943, no doubt the work of René Cassin. Declarations prepared by the philosopher Jacques Maritain in 1942 and in 1944 by Georges Gouvich and Emmanuel Mounier, all proposed social and e economic rights. Of more direct influence of the deputies of 19, on the deputies of 1946 was the 1944 program of the National Resistance Council. That program set out a framework for a program of social and economic transfer, transformations that would follow liberation, a democracy enhanced by universal suffrage, the more complete freedom of thought, expression and conscience, and the affirmation of, quote, the respect of the human being. The rights expressed in the 1946 uh, so the rights expressed in 1946 echoed both this program and the draft declaration of the 1936 Congress of the Ligue des Droits de l'Homme. So turning to the 1946 uh, debates in the Constitutional Commission, the historian Gordon Wright notes especially the political divide that stifled debates on the Declaration of Rights. The left and right, he said, he says, uh, were divided in large part by the left's insistence on individual rights and the right's insistence on communal collective rights. And by that, the right uh, would, would include the, uh, mainly the Christian Democratic Mouvement Republican Populaire, the uh, third party in the tripartite arrangement of, uh, of the uh, constituent. So collective rights, including the protection of the family, community, religious organisations and the role of the state in assuring liberties. These divisions, however, were not an obstacle to the Constituent Assembly's approval of the draft declaration of uh, April, May 1946. But Wright's observations turn our attention to debates in the Constitutional Commission. 
where proposed texts were scrutinized, criticized, defended, rationalized, and amended. The very real difficulties of defining social and ec economic rights became apparent. These were new rights uh, and they were more than declarations of principles. They attempted to address the contingencies of social and economic circumstances that shaped daily life and which demonstrated liberties, uh, the limits of liberty and equality. But in so doing, they were also trying to set down fundamental principles to try to define the fundaments of social and economic rights and uh, equality. I'll illustrate these uh, difficulties with reference to three particularly contested instances. And for this, I'll bring up um, some slides of showing you extracts from the, uh, the articles that were debated in the, Cong uh, in the Constitutional Commission. They are quite long. I won't speak to them or read them. I'll just leave uh, uh, you, the viewer, to uh, hit the pause button and uh, read at your leisure. The first example is an article on what uh, could be called the gratuity de la justice. That's the right of all to access justice equally, irrespective of financial means. As debate progressed, the difficulties of framing this in a precise definition became evident, leading to a number of revisions as the right, as the right form of words was sought. As a consequence, it expanded and lost part of its original intent. Practical questions followed, pr followed from the simple declaration of free justice, la gratuité de la justice. How would the cost of justice be met? How would vexatious suits be decided? How would judges determine costs? In other words, the principle, uh, of right, the principle of the right to justice, when defined, raised questions as to how it would be applied in practice. Here are just, um, uh, sorry, I cited on the wrong slide there. So go back there, as so you can see here from the original, uh, uh, from the original um, uh, version, there were three revisions going into a fourth revision before a final revision that was agreed in the Constitutional Commission, and then a, another revision before it was included in the, uh, the final draft of the Declaration of Rights. So in other words, the process of defining the right raised issues that uh, really related more to questions of application in practice. These questions, it was noted, would need to be resolved by the administrative reform of the justice system and not by the Constitutional Commission. Yet the questions intruded into the discussions on rights. In the end, the article returned to a statement of the principle that material circumstances should not be an impediment to the pursuit of justice. And uh, you see from those uh, examples that um, a simple declaration was expanded upon and then pulled back again to this fundamental principle here. A similar problem was evident in the second example and that's on the right of children to an education. But it had the added complexity of the political divisions that Gordon Wright has noted, that is between individual rights and collective rights. A further complexity arose from the implicit meaning that some found in the idea of a right to an education, namely the right to educate. The original text noted the rights of uh, suitably qualified people to teach. But this was again grounds for asserting collective rights in the provision of education. So, for example, the individual right of the child to be educated was challenged by the collective right of the family to decide the nature of education and the freedom of individuals and groups to provide education. This was an implicit assertion which was only made explicit towards the end of the debate of the role of the Catholic Church in a child's education. This raised anti-clerical alarm among the Marxists, according to Gordon Wright, and also fomented a dispute uh, in principle between collective rights and individual rights. The final form of the, uh, the text in the draft uh, Declaration of Rights of April 1946 here omitted the, uh, the uh, implication of a right to educate. So the third example relates to uh, what was listed as Article 16 of the draft Declaration of Rights on the access of those from the French Union to employment 
and professions within France. The third paragraph was especially problematic for a number of deputies. The use of the term citoyen et citoyenne uh, declared redundant following the recognition of the equal rights of uh, women was criticized for being ignorant of the status of those who lived in the French Union. They were French men and women without necessarily being French citizens. This opened up a wider debate on the status of foreign nationals, that is non-citizens in France and the French Union, and on their access to the professions, especially to the law. This was itself a divisive issue as, a divisive issue, as it instantly evoked historical memories of the distinction in the legal status and the employment of immigrants and the provision of uh, French, the, the protection of the French labour market from immigrant workers before the war. Distinctions that continue to be demanded, for example, by the CGT. The nationality laws of 1889 and 1927 were also cited in the debates, raising questions in the minds of some of a defence of pre-war anti-Semitism and the prohibition of Jews from the legal profession after 1933. This was an issue that it soon became clear was not suitable for inclusion in the Declarations of Rights. It was in, if it was included, then it would need to be either a restricted right or a right moderated in administrative practice. And that would defy the logic of a Declaration of Rights altogether. Otherwise, it would have to be general in meaning and therefore applicable to all foreign nationals. If that were the case, then the millions of foreign workers in France would be considered to have the same rights as naturalised foreigners. In reality, the French border was not open to all foreigners and administrative regulations limited their rights. This is the final form of that article in the draft declaration. The debate moved well beyond the intent of the article which related to the freedom of inhabitants of the French Union to hold public office. The final version of the article stressed this point by adopting the term ressortissant of the French Union, who would enjoy the same political rights as citizens. This article is indicative of the ways in which certain principles prompted broader discussions that had unanticipated implications. This might be put down to the complications of defining new rights in which much was being invested and from which much was expected. These rights were being defined and refined through the process of being written into a declaration. They, were nevertheless, they nevertheless exposed divisions that were more than political. Many issues were rooted in different, differing conceptions of the new constitutional order, or more simply, they were divisions over the very idea of and purpose behind the Declaration of Rights. And this was partly due to the historical resonance of the regular allusions back to the Declaration of 1789. So, for example, in the, uh, in the debate on Article 16, which became Article 18 in the final draft, the Communist deputy Pierre Hervé interjected that the declaration was particularly vexed because it attempted to define specific principles while the Constitutional Commission had not really spelt out the objectives of the declaration beyond the desire to complete the work of 1789. The Commission, Hervé asserted, had to decide whether the Declaration should instead be universalist in its intent and general in its meaning. Otherwise, it should abandon the idea of a new Declaration and be content with preserving the Declaration of 1789. This position was restated in the Constituent Assembly in March 1946 when, the, uh, when it was presented with the draft, de draft of the Constitution. It was not stated by another communist deputy, however, but rather by the elder, the elder statement of, statesman of the moderate centre, Edouard Herriot. He rejected the compromise evident in the text of the Declaration of Rights of 1946, noting the significance of the 1789 Declaration was its universal conception of rights, which he said France had bequeathed to the world. That declaration, he said, represented a struggle against governments, not against government and the singular, which was the motivation behind the 1946 declaration. He argued that the new text had turned its back on the original universal principles because the social and economic rights it included were specific to France and specific to the present time. For Edio, the text of the 1936 Congress of the Ligue des Droits de l'Homme was preferable to the declaration of 1946. The Constitution failed to gain popular support 
in the national referendum of the 5th of May 1946. A second constituent assembly was elected in June and the constitution was rewritten, approved and adopted on the 17th of October 1946, becoming the constitution of the Fourth Republic. There was no pressing need expressed at the time for a major revision of the Declaration of Rights. Indeed, the Socialists put forward a proposal for, a for the same Declaration of Rights, but with very minimal change, holding firm to the commitment uh, for social and economic rights in the first Constituent Assembly. The Mouvement Républicain Populaire proposed a text that reproduced the text of the 1789 Declaration to which it appended the social and economic rights drawn from the draft document of 1946. By the time the Constitutional Commission uh, began to meet in August 1946, however, a consensus was forming that a short statement of fundamental principles was prefer preferable to the lengthy detailed declaration. This was not a concession to the critics of the first version, nor did the deputies believe they could not improve on that text. They clearly thought they could. Rather, it was a decision reached after a reconsideration of the very purpose of a Declaration of Rights. So this followed a question as to whether a Declaration of Rights was, quote, absolutely indispensable, since it carried no legal weight and its value was purely theoretical. Did the rights that the deputies wished to declare need to be developed over so many articles, 39 in total in the 40, 1946 document, or could they be expressed more concisely as simple general principles in a preamble to the constitution. Some deputies were not convinced that this was a wise, that it was wise to turn away from a declaration of rights, as that could be seen to be a retreat from the ambitions it represented. But there was wide support for a much shorter and stronger text that would satisfy these expectations. The preamble therefore avoided earlier arguments. Indeed, there was little time to repraise those arguments as the new constitution could not be unduly, del unduly delayed before national elections for a new legislature could be held. As a statement of principle, as, sta as a statement of principles, the preamble would reflect the foundation document of 1789 and the principles of subsequent declarations without repeating their content. It would instead express how rights evolve in response to shifting political, social and economic conditions. So briefly in conclusion then, it was not, that the, it was not the case that the Constitution of 1946 omitted a declaration of rights because the draft of the declaration failed in its objectives. This was certainly not the case. The debates that drafted the declaration were trying to find the right form of expression for the, the new social and economic rights that were considered indispensable for the post-war republic. The short form adopted in the preamble expressed them better. And I would suggest as statements of principle, they had greater force. Thank you for atten your attention. Thank you.